The views and opinions expressed by guests on the TWBC podcast are solely those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views of nor constitute an endorsement by the host, TWBC, or the advertisers. National Championships, Confederation Championships, World Championships, Major Professional Events. For over three decades, he has been there for many of the sport's greatest moments. And now he brings you even closer to the movers and shakers in the world of high echelon tournament water skiing. From the founder and creator of the Water Ski Broadcasting Company comes the TWBC Podcast. And now here's your host, Tony Lightfoot. Well, greetings one and all. I am the aforementioned Tony Lightfoot, and this indeed is the latest episode of the TWBC podcast. Uh, uh, salutations to every single one of you out there. And uh, joining us in this episode, uh, uh, prior to the World Championships, uh, and actually been recorded at International Tournament Skiing, otherwise known as Jack's Place or Jack Travers's Place, is uh, Lauren Morgan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um it's kind of exciting seeing everybody start showing up here. It's my home, my second home, I guess. Um, and it's just, it's funny. It's like, you know, it's time. World is here. It seems like it's been a long time coming. Yeah, you kind of have you kind of have that little bit of a vibe about, you know, you're just like kind of waiting and, you know, just absolutely just cannot wait for the thing to start, huh? Yeah, exactly. I'm just trying to pace myself a little bit. All right, then. So, uh, Lauren, uh, you mo- uh You've 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 won a number of titles. I mean, you're one you're one of the uh, the elite jumpers in in all of the world. Uh, but uh, we don't see you an awful lot at tournaments uh, these days. Uh, uh, explain to the good folks out there why. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, do you want my elevator pitch or my or the full thing? Full thing. Go okay. for it. We've got enough time. All right. So I'm I'm doing my PhD in criminology and criminal justice, um, and I am researching specifically researching the juvenile justice system and kind of the intersection of child welfare, foster care, and juvenile justice. So um, my first two years I spent doing coursework, and I started in 2019. Um, and then now I am in my comprehensive exam stage, so just doing a lot of writing, a lot of research, um, and my head's in the books. Um, got about a year left after this comp stage, and then hopefully I'll be a doctor. Oh, excellent, excellent stuff. So, uh, so, so whereabouts are you studying that? That's in St. Louis, isn't it? Yeah, it's in St. Louis. Um, so the first two years, I pretty much had to be uh, tied down there, going to classes and stuff. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, I moved down to Florida for a few months and, and finished courses. And then uh, I've kind of been back and forth between St. Louis and Nashville um, there with my boyfriend, Jason. Um, and things now are pretty much remote because I'm doing my research and writing. So don't have to necessarily be in St. Louis all the time, but um, I still hop back and forth. So in so I would say in some ways, I mean, from what you said, you know, it's it sounds like that the that the pandemic as awful as it awful as it is and was actually had a somewhat positive effect by bringing you out of the classroom and bringing you further down south to where your original home was and uh, and and continue to get some sets in and uh, continue to ski at the high level that you're accustomed to. Yeah, exactly. The pandemic was actually really good to me. Um, I, Like I said, I drove straight down here when kind of the lockdown started. I got to kind of for the first time in quite a few years work on my skiing a bit and kind of take some steps backwards instead of always just like rushing to prepare for a tournament uh, the next weekend or whatever it is. Um, and so that was nice. Um, and then, you know, this spring I, I also got to come down here with things being remote and, and get some skiing in with uh, the Travers here and also Ryan Dodd. And that was really helpful. Um, I hadn't been able to take that long of a, of a period of time to devote to my skiing since I was a junior, honestly. So it was great. Okay, a lot, as you could probably hear in the background, a lot of activity going on prior to the World Champion Championships, you know, so... Uh, the tournament coming up, uh, how have you been training up until this at this point, you know, because, I mean, things really start to get real and things really start to uh, to ratchet up, uh, uh, you know, several notches uh, between now and the start, which is Tuesday, but you don't get to jump until about maybe Thursday, Friday, right? Yeah, I jump Friday and I think our official practice is Monday. 
Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll get a couple sets somewhere else, just kind of riding my skis to stay on the water. Uh, but practice has been going really well. I, um, I like to think of tournaments leading up to the event as practice, if you will. Um, and I had um, a tournament a couple weeks ago at Fluid and, and jumped uh, 178, and then last weekend 182, so close to my PB. So it's starting to come together. Who has impressed you so far this season in the jump event, you know, among um, among the women competitors, you know, because the pandemic has really uh, put, uh, thrown a wrench into the schedules of a lot of the uh, the female jumpers that, that compete against you alongside you type deal. But there have been opportunities uh, for, uh, for, for, for some of y'all to actually compete. So who has stood out for you so far? Yeah, well, of course, uh, Jacinta was kind of stuck in Australia during these couple of months, so... Um, in a way, it was kind of uh, interesting and, and kind of, you know, brought some other people to the table. Um, Hannah has really been jumping well, and she's been super consistent. I think she's she won every event um, up until Malibu opened. So, and then I was right behind her with second at most events. Um, and then also uh, my fellow American, Brittany Greenwood, she had a couple of big jumps this year, so I'm really happy for her. Excellent stuff. So, what do you, what do you honestly think it's going to take uh, for uh, for you or for anyone else to actually make it through to the jump final? Just kind of give us an idea of what the cut line would could potentially be, uh, distance wise. I'm thinking around 49 meters. Um, I think it's definitely going to be the biggest final we've ever seen in all all three events, both men and women. Um, traditionally, I think the, the cut is around 47 meters. Um, and so, yeah, I think it'll be up around 49, maybe, maybe 49.5, maybe even 50. Yeah, so around about 100, 160, maybe about 162, up to about 164 feet, around yeah. about that, that range. Yeah. For those of you who don't quite understand the metric system anyway. So when you are training, who do you typically confide to so far as guiding you along with your training sets out there on the jump lake? I have so many people, honestly, and it's and that's what's really nice. I think at this stage of my career, I've been able to, to jump with so many people. Of course, here at Jack's, I have uh, Jack and Chris, who I get to talk to. Chris watches me a lot. Um, I also have Tangy Benet. He's he's here all the time, giving me pointers. Mark Lane, uh, Ryan Dodd. So, like I said, I have quite a few people. John Carter, uh, I've been skiing with him a lot up in Tennessee, and, and he's actually helped me a lot as well. So. Okay, so uh, you're you're jumping. You're uh, from from what I'm from what I'm hearing. Uh, are you just jumping at the World Championships, or will you be taken to the water in other events? No, just jump. This is probably the first year I could have slalomed if I wanted to, and uh, for so many years that would have been something that I would have wanted to do. Um, but this year, just pra- just focusing on jump. Because a lot of not a lot of not not a lot of people know, but you have been a world slalom champion way way back in the day in the junior world championships uh, way back in 2010. That's right. Yeah, it's hard to believe sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I go out in slalom these days, and I'm like, how did I do that? <laughs> but uh, but we can but we continue right but we continue right along. Oh yeah, you won the overall championship of that year as well in 2010. No, uh, 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 no, no. I won jump and slalom, and I missed overall because my my excellent trick skills but it's okay we don't have to talk about that <laughs> okay that's that okay or but let's say top three which it, yes. which it, which is impressive yes. enough in itself you know i think janina won so yeah yeah absolutely right you are right on that one so uh a lot of a lot of great skiing to come uh you've i mean you, your home away from home is, is is down here next to sunset lakes the home of international tournament skiing uh i mean the I mean the atmosphere. I mean, if if you can if you can put it into words, just looking around and seeing the folks uh, on on the on the on the dock uh, for for jump and slalom, and also down here for tricks. You know, it's a little bit quiet here for tricks, if we're being honest. But about the other docks, kind of kind of give a sense to the good folks that are listening. It, it, is is there tension? Is is there kind of a relaxed feel about the about the about the site? I think there's a good mix of both. I mean, we definitely we're going to see the highest level we've ever seen at Worlds. I think, um, especially in the men's overall event, and a lot of the men's overall guys are skiing here and competing. And so I think it's like this healthy tension um, competition, but also like camaraderie where uh, they're all you know out there skiing together. But you know, at the end of the day, one of them is going to win, and one of them wants to win. Um, and so it's interesting. Um, 
there's there's tension, but I, I think people are also pretty relaxed. We're not, you know, going to a site where there's going to be any surprises. We we all know this site really well, so I think you can expect some really big scores. All right, then, uh, kind of turning the tension uh, to to a little bit less of a light-hearted subject. Uh, that's uh, women in sports in general. I know that I know that a few a few months ago you you had you, you had made some some comments online, and they they did uh, reverberate around the skiing world about about, about your feelings about about women in sports and how and, and how some are, are just are just treated absolutely horribly you know uh i mean expand ex- expand upon that a little bit and uh, give it give us a sense of where you feel right now today in 2021 yeah um i won't without you know naming names or going into it too in depth um you know i think there's just with any sport and we're seeing this in, in gymnastics and um in several sports um you know there's this power dynamic um and at the end of the day, we're women, so um, sometimes we're not treated with the respect I think that we deserve. Um, and I think that our voices don't come out as strongly as they, they should in some cases. And, um, you know, each year we'll push the needle and things will get a little bit better, but we have a long way to come. So you're obviously looking at the situations that were experienced by the likes of Michaela Maroney and... Uh, and uh, and Simone Biles uh, with with extreme interest in that regard, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, just unfortunate events that kind of went on for too long um, with not enough attention given to them. Um, and also just uh, in positions where they they didn't feel um, like they had the support to come out. And I'm really proud of them and happy that we have some kind of role models to... Um, kind of gauge ourselves off of and maybe they will encourage others okay another another subject that's uh, that's come that's come forward in recent times is the actual fairness uh with with women in sports because uh i don't know i don't know whether you i don't know whether you saw this but uh, there was a new zealand weightlifter uh, Lauren Hubbard, as, as she's known by, was a re- wa- was biologically born as a man and actually weightlifted for uh, for a good few years and now and transitioned uh, to a woman and qualified to be on the New Zealand team for the Tokyo Olympic Games. Now, Jacinta was actually asked this question, being as she was actually involved in a competitive le- level in weightlifting, you know, but. She actually said that the decision by the IOC to allow that kind of thing to happen was a slap in the face to all female athletes who had worked hard to get to that point to qualify and to compete. Do you feel the same way? Yes, absolutely. I think she hit the nail on the head. I actually listened to uh, her podcast. And um, yeah, I mean, we are just different. Um, I think she put it, she articulated it a little bit better. She She's a big biology kind of nerd. nerd. <laughs> yeah, she said her words. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's just, it, we're, we're not made the same way as, as men biologically. And so, no, I don't think it's right. And it's super unfair to women who train their whole lives, you know. Do you think that there is a possibility? I mean, I mean, th- I mean, this is kind of like a unique case, but I'm sure that it that the implications are going to reverberate beyond weightlifting to other sports, maybe even ours. You know, as as relatively small as our sport is, you know, are you? Yeah, I, I know, I, I know, you kind of grim- grimace at that prospect, but the reality is there. The Pandora's box has been opened, so mm-hmm. to speak. Uh, are you fearful that something could potentially happen like that within our sport? Um, I don't. I'm. I haven't thought about it. To be honest, it's a good question. Um, just because I, I, our sport is so small, and there, it's like you know, there's not a ton of money in our sport, so I don't feel like people or. I mean, fame for that matter, sadly. So I don't think people would feel inclined to be doing that. But, you know, it could happen. Um, And I guess there's always a possibility. So um, maybe it's something we need to get ahead of. Indeed, indeed. May, may, maybe the the IWWF should be presented with this issue. Maybe they should vote on it and say forthrightly, now and for all, we're not going to allow. 
Yeah, I agree. Okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap up uh, the podcast. Thank you very much uh, for doing that, uh, for doing this podcast. But I normally leave a little bit of space at the end for you to uh, to give a shout out, friends, family, supporters, that kind of stuff. So the mic is yours. Uh, go right ahead. All right. Well, thank you, Tony, for having me. Um, I'll give a shout out to my parents. Wouldn't be here without them. Um, I wouldn't even be in the sport without them. So thank you so much. Um, again, I've named some of these people already, but the whole crew here at Travers, um, the Miranda family, um, my boyfriend Jason, uh, Tangy Benet, uh, Ryan Dodd, uh, the list goes on and on. But so many people, Mark Lane, of course, too. Uh, so many people, but, um, you know, it takes a village. And uh, again, thanks for having me, Tony. Why, thank you very much. And uh, that was uh, Laura Morgan. My name's Tony Lightford, and this has been the latest edition of the TWBC podcast. So until next time, it is ciao for now. Thank you for listening to the TWBC podcast. Be sure to check out our website at waterskibroadcasting.com. Links to our presence on major social media platforms can be found there, as well as updates to our webcast and this podcast. Duplication or rebroadcasting of this broadcast without written consent of TWBC is prohibited. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to join us next time for the next edition of the TWBC Podcast.